Hi, everybody. It is Ayla, Wife with a Purpose, coming to you live this evening. And I have uh, Trad Traditional Mike with me tonight. Uh, you guys are probably familiar with his work. If you're familiar with mine, he is a co writer on the website Wife with a Purpose. He also um, has a Twitter at Traditional Mike. And um, he is the one that is my right hand man, helps me with all my campaigns. And we're here tonight to do a special live broadcast about the 100th anniversary um, of the death of the last czar of Russia and his family. So go ahead and say hello, Mike. Hello, everyone. Hello, Ella. Thank you very much for having me on the program again. It's lovely to be with you all. Of course, of course. So um, this is going to be kind of a tough subject matter. Um, it, it's going to be one of those things that you know, it's a sad subject, but uh, we're going to get through this. There might be some tears on on either one of our ends, but um, we really wanted to be able to do this and do this at about the time frame that the family was actually killed. So I want to emphasize that not only is this the day, but, you know, even with time zones and consideration, everything else, this is the approximate time in about a half hour to an hour of when they were actually um shot, stabbed, and killed. Um, and I'll, I'll start out by just talking briefly about how we came to do this as our July campaign. As those of you who follow me might know, we kind of have a campaign with Wife for the Purpose Ministries that we run every month. Um, last month, for example, was Righteous Fatherhood uh, being the month of uh, Father's Day and so forth. We wanted to bring some joy and happiness and such, shed some light on the wonderful contributions that righteous fathers make to our families and our civilization and our community and to really honor them. And so this month we actually, because we pre planned and all of our things back a year ago, we um, had actually planned a different subject matter for July. And um, Mike's the one that keeps me, he keeps track of everything for me. And I, I messaged him and said, you know, what is our theme for July towards the end of June? And um, he sent it to me and I just, it wasn't sitting right with me. I was like, I don't think it's what we're supposed to do. And, and so I thought, you know what? I, I'll try to get this together. So I was trying to come up with a catchphrase. I'm trying to come up with like the idea of where we're going to go with the with the July campaign and it's just not formulating. And so I sat down and I took it to prayer and I was praying about it and just like a ton of bricks, you know, it hit me that that's not the subject we're supposed to do because July is the 100th anniversary of the death of the last czar of Russia. And that was a story that was very near and dear to my heart. So I kind of threw that out uh, to Mike. And I wasn't sure what his response was going to be because I didn't know how familiar he was with the story. And so what was your response? Um, well, I, I, I knew some of the story, obviously, because from history. But I didn't know the people involved so much because at the end of the day, the... Um, the family are people like you or me or anyone else. And I, I knew more the historical facts, but I didn't know their story. So in a way, doing this for the past 17 days for me now, I'm in the future, um, <laughs> has been um, has been really good. I've uh, I've learned a lot myself and it's expanded my knowledge about the, the last czar and his family. Oh yeah, definitely. I think that you way surpassed me like by day two. Um, as I was explaining to Mike uh, earlier when we started this campaign, this is a story that was kind of near and dear to my heart. Um, I actually first heard about it um, in, when I was in sixth grade and I still remember the exact moment. I was in uh, Mr. Urema's um, <laughs> social studies class in sixth grade and um, he had made reference to the last Tsar of Russia and how when the communists had taken over, they had executed the entire family so that not to leave an heir to the throne. And he almost said it in passing, like, oh, and this happened and this is, and I heard execution of entire royal family and, and my, you know, young sixth grade brain was just immediately rapid fire with questions. And I, so I was raising my hand, practically shouting like, oh my gosh, were there babies? How old were they? What, you know, but he didn't know. He, he just was like, well, I don't know. Was, I know it was a family. I know he had a couple of kids, but I don't know anything else. 
Um, so I'm going to date myself. I had to go home that evening and go to my Encyclopedia Britannica. Uh, this was before the internet and, um, look them up. And then I, that was the first time that I ever had read about them and it developed really into a lifelong love of this family. And particularly when I was a teenager, I read a lot and I studied a lot about them. And so at any rate, um, as we've eked closer to the 100th anniversary, so last year obviously was the 100th anniversary of when um, Nicholas lost the, the throne, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, then this is the, the year of, of the death. And then also in the, when it was the 90 year anniversary, there was a lot of um, articles and newspapers and such put, put out things about it. But I've been kind of almost dreading it in a way because I was like, oh, it's going to come up again. And it's such a hard story. But I just knew, especially in the wisdom that I've gained just in the past three years and past 10 years of my life, really putting the story into perspective. It isn't just a story of a, of a government revolution that, you know, well, they, you know, killed them all to leave no heir. That's part of it. But really what they were and what they symbolized and, and how their uh, dynasty collapsed and what happened to Russia afterwards is so important to understand. And it's something that really in history, we're not taught very much about. So I think um, maybe what we'll do is, Mike, why don't you just give us, um, since you've been able to like read and study about this so much recently, and it's very fresh in your mind, um, give us a, a brief overview of the family. Who Who were they? How many children did they have? That sort of thing. Um, well, yeah, fresh, fresh in my mind. It's exploded with information. <laughs> <laughs> um, obviously, we start with the head of the family, um, Nicholas himself, Nicholas II, as he was, uh, the last Tsar, um, Russian-born, obviously. Um, then he married um, his bride, and they were so much in love. Um, you can go to the website there's some diary entries from their um time together um and they um alexandra and uh, uh, um nicholas were very much in love and then of course they had five uh children in total they had the um the four girls first olga tatiana maria and anastasia and in 1904, they had little Alexei, who, of course, was the, um, and we've got the, the girls up there by the looks of it, mm -hmm, and um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, in 1904 they had their last, they, they had them in very quick succession, uh, and in 1904 they had Alexei, who was of course the, um, the um, the heir to the Russian throne at that point, because obviously in uh, in that time, obviously, none of the Grand Duchesses could obviously take over. The, the throne as the um as the heir to uh the czar correct yeah so it was really important that they have a boy but he had um a little bit of a problem um do you want to tell yeah, us about um, that um alexandra well actually so is um nicholas as well but alexandra was a relative of queen victoria who, of course, was a hemophiliac, and that carried through to Alexei. Um, and he, uh, all, all, I don't know if all of the children had it, but he, um, mm -hmm. he had it worse than any of them, and was very, very ill. In fact, during the time of the outbreak of the war, um, World War One, that is, um, Alexandra also became very, quite ill at for quite long periods of time as well so and of course nicholas was away a lot of the time with the with the war going on so they um you know which which really separated them because they were so close in their relationship and i've emphasized that already but they um they were so close as a couple um their their diary entries and letters to each other show that how much they missed each other while nicholas was away with the with the fighting but um alexei was uh very sick with his hemophilia and it um, severely ad adversely affected his health, unfortunately. Yes. So he. So for those that may be unfamiliar, hemophilia is um, a blood disorder in which the blood does not clot uh, properly. 
So, and it is very common um, once you get it inside of a family group that it kind of hangs out there and it, it is passed through the maternal line. And um, yeah, as Mike said, it, it was on Queen Victoria's side, which um, Alexandra was her granddaughter. And Queen Victoria had four boys, one of whom had heal hemophilia. And that's kind of your um, your average outcome for being able to pass it when you have the gene is probably about one in four is the average of uh, your sons who will have it. You pass it to your sons. Um, but they got unlucky in, in that their one and only son ended up having it. And Alexandra very much blamed herself um, quite a great deal for having such a, an ill child. And it was something that was very much on their heart, particularly since they were such a close family, as you said. And also because they'd had the four girls first. And of course, um, thinking that maybe they would, you know, perhaps very likely die without an heir to the throne. And then to have little Alexei, but then find out when he was an infant that he has this very um, difficult disorder. And it was one such that at the time, some people with hemophilia went on to lead fairly normal lives. You know, they would be bedridden from time to time with illness related to uh, internal bruising, but they um, they could lead fairly normal lives. Others, depending on the severity of the illness and um, any, you know, falls or injuries that they may have, um, you know, died quite young. And as Alexei was going on with his his age, he was a, a young teenager when the family was killed. He he had had quite um, a, a lot of bouts of severe bleeding, particularly in his knee area. And uh, the bleeding would cause the bones to warp. And uh, at the time of their death, um, Alexei unfortunately was not able to walk. He was crippled. Um, so that was the dynamic that kind of was in their family as they had this very desired heir to the throne who then was very ill and they were a very close family, very religious family as well. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that, Mike? Um, because I think that is so crucial to understanding this family and what they represented um, for their people and, and for us today was their amazing religious devotion and piety. Yes, um, exactly. They were, um, well, Alexandra obviously was of German descent originally, um, so she was originally Lutheran, but uh, the family, the, the entire, she converted to Russian Orthodoxy when she became Empress and married Nicholas, and they were extremely devout in their faith. Um, the girls, for example, um, the four girls, uh, beside their bed had things like prayer books and um, the copies of the Gospels and candles and, and uh, crucifixes and things of that nature. So ob obviously, you know, in, in the evening or in the morning or whatever the case might have been, they obviously, you know, read their Gospels and said their prayers and things like that. And, and the faith of their, um, of the parents came and was evident in the lives of the children. And even to jump forward to today, um, a lot of Russian people um, consider that, consider the, the family to be um, really important people of faith. And since everything has happened in the past hundred years, they want to go back to the faith of that family. That's how important they were to the to the to the broader Russian people. Definitely, yeah. So they were Russian Orthodox, and um, which is um, an original branch of Christianity, a very old branch of Christianity, and um, they are actually considered saints in the Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia, also known as Rokor, and they are considered. Um, very holy people within the Russian Orthodox faith within Russia. And they may become saints one day in that faith as well, but they are considered martyrs. Um, the, the czar was very much, his position was very much connected to a spiritual sense of, of the Russian people. And I think that this is where um, it's really important to um, kind of understand that, in in they weren't just the, the king and queen or or the czar and czarina to the russian people they were ordained of god 
to rule over Russia and to rule, you know, righteously and justly. And, and both the Tsar and Tsarina took that commission very seriously and very, they were very spiritual people and wanted to do what they felt was um, how God would have them rule. And um, it was, it was a very cohesive way. There's a lot of ethnic groups, most people know in, in Russia, um, as far as, um, you know, you kind of have your Ukrainians and, and, you know, then down around the Caucasus, you have a lot of different groups. And then even over towards the Asiatic areas in Siberia, there's a lot of little um, ethnic enclaves in, in what we would consider the greater Russian area. But having the Russian Orthodox faith and having a czar that was ordained by God was something that was um, unifying for Russia. Um, and it kind of almost superseded those little ethnic enclaves, um, if you will, and helped create a cohesive culture and a, and a cohesive harmony within, within that country. And it's something that I cannot stress enough that we've really lost. And I'm not advocating necessarily for monarchy, but when you look back you know, at our history, in our countries, when we had rulers who were religious, religiously and ethnically tied to the land and the homeland of the people that they were ruling, um, they were a lot less likely to face a lot of the problems that we face today in the West, um, issues of, you know, mass immigration and, you know, um, sussing out migrant and refugee issues and, and a lot of the divisiveness that we've seen in, in particularly in America, um, in, in the last couple of years was, was something that was, um, you could unify a culture and a people a little bit better, particularly under this sort of system. And so that's really what Nicholas represented um, and his family represented. And they were one of the last, pretty much the last Christian, strong Christian monarchy left in Europe. And, and a lot of people will, you know, kind of uh, say, well, does Russia count as Europe and, and all of this? But Russia, I think for the most part, you could, you know, it's Eastern Europe, it counts as Europe. And of course, Nicholas and Alexandra themselves were ethnically European. She was German, as we mentioned earlier. So they're definitely European in that sense as well, and culturally very European. And um, so they represented that last strong Christian monarchy. Because as you know, we have still monarchs in England and Sweden and places like this, but they don't really carry a lot of weight, a lot of power. Um, and they're they're quite honestly just, for the most part, not well-respected in a lot of the community, you know, um, famously the kind of the English royal family is a little bit, become a little bit of a tabloid sensationalist um, family, although there are members of that family that seem to be working very hard to uh, regain some class and nobility uh, to that family. But obviously in the past hundred years, uh, monarchs in Europe have not really had any, any real power. And this was um, one of the last monarchs to have a lot of power, which, was one of the reasons he was targeted, him and his family. And um, also he was very wealthy. One of the things that a lot of people don't realize because we kind of think of Russia as it is today, which is, you know, recovering from a lot of economic downfall, you know, dilapidated buildings and, and so forth. But that was not the case under Tsarist Russia. Tsarist Russia actually was the wealthiest country on earth at the time. Um, Nicholas II was the wealthiest man alive. Um, a lot of people don't realize that Russia had worked very hard over many centuries to acquire a lot of wealth and prestige and influence in the world, and that they were technologically on par with the West. And this is something else that we're kind of not told about, that they had their own, they were producing their own automobiles, which was a new technology at the time. They were uh, manufacturing their own airplanes. And in fact, the airplanes in Russia at the time in the Tsarist Russia were, were larger, uh, had larger wingspans and were in, in a lot of ways um, superior to uh, some of the, the planes being manufactured over in the West. So they, they were doing a little bit better in some areas and were definitely on par in other areas of technology and things like this. And it wasn't until after the Bolshevik revolution that the country was bankrupt. And um, that was something that I went into my uh, new media central uh, .net article today that was posted over there um, for a few hours ago and um, talking about how that was a huge 
that was one of the biggest reasons for the revolution itself, which ended in the czar's um, family being executed. Um, a lot of people have been sold this bill of goods. They've, we've been told that it was some sort of like peasant uprising, that factory workers were upset and that the czar lived in opulence and that he was incompetent and that he was weak or that he was on drugs or all of these other uh, uh, fairy tales and that the people, the Russian people wanted to rise up and, you know, overthrow this, um, this, this tyrant that they lived under. And um, nothing could be further from the truth. Um, and in fact, um, the people, the Russian people loved the czar. As I said before, they, they saw him as ordained by God. Most of them loved the czar and it wasn't, it was really um, outside forces that created the revolution. And if you go to my new media central.net article today, you can find the, the references for the things that I'm talking about. But Trotsky, so Lenin and Trotsky, the two main um, instigators of the revolution, the communist Bolshevik re revolution in Russia, Trotsky uh, was living in New York and was all actually given um, 20, $20 million by bankers in New York. And he was get issued a passport by Woodrow Wilson, our, our American president at the time, and um, allowed to round up some of his cohorts there in New York. And actually they shipped him over to Russia full of uh, piss and vinegar to kind of start this revolution. Um, King George at the time over in England, um, King George V, was the cousin of Tsar Nicholas II. And he was um, quite envious of the Tsar's uh, wealth and prestige. And he aided in getting Lenin, who was um, living in Sweden at the time, um, passports and uh, papers and documents and everything. Canada also was part of this, getting papers and documents for these two gentlemen to be able to travel through multiple countries to get them back into Russia and finance the revolution. And so what a lot of people don't realize is that America and a lot of other Western countries actually bought and paid for the Russian revolution that ended up in, in the czar's death. And when they did, when Lenin and Trotsky did go into Russia, it was not ethnic Russians that for the most part that they were stirring up against the czar. For the most part, it was these enclaves of immigrant communities that came from other areas that had been living in Russia who numbered in the millions, that they really got them together and said, you know, to, to start this revolution. And I think that's something that we in the West, whether it be Canada, America, Australia, that is something that we can really relate to right now, because what we have happening in our countries are a huge influx of immigrant communities who don't agree with our values, who don't agree with our religion, who don't agree with our culture, and who are trying to start their own revolutions within our countries, um, whether that be over in England, you know, in instituting these Sharia law courts and things like that, or whether it be in, a, in America, down in the Southwest, you have places where, um, you know, they don't speak English at all anymore. Entire towns have been taken over. Um, and then up in New York, you know, we just recently had um, an open socialist win a primary election or not win, or win the win the election to be in the primary um, up in New York for the, I believe it was the 14th, four, she won the 14th district and the 15th district as a write-in, even though she wasn't even running. Um, and she's an open socialist. And of course, we had Bernie Sanders in the last presidential election, again, another open socialist. And as we all know, Lenin famously said, socialism is the goal, the end goal of socialism is communism. So these are all tied together. These are all the same ideology. And it really was financed in America, sent to Russia to just literally kill the last strong Christian monarch um, in that country. And um, once he once he was out of the way, they moved on to loot the country. Um, a lot of the gold and reserves and all of the wealth of Russia ended up back lining the pockets of the billionaires on Wall Street who had originally financed the whole revolution to begin with. So that by the time the Bolsheviks took control, they were bankrupt. And they actually had to appeal to America, of all places, for money. And uh, good old President Woodrow Wilson, again, gave them $25 million um, to stave off their just inevitable collapse because they had nothing to work with. Um, they had gotten rid of all the factory workers. They had these factories were standing open with uh, desolate with nobody to work them. And even after the influx of cash 
that the West gave them multiple times over the first few decades of communism. They still needed Asian and Western people to come in and work, basically capitalists to come in and work and run those factories. Otherwise, communism just would have completely disintegrated right as it was beginning to take off. And it only really collapsed later in the 80s because a lot of the financing they were getting from the West stopped during the the great um, well-known recession that was happening in the West uh, in the 1980s. And so it's really important to realize that the exact same ideologies and the exact same forces that were behind this revolution in Russia have now come full circle. They're back in New York City. They're now they're being democratically elected to seats and and they are using the same tactics again. They are fomenting hatred against the native ethnic peoples or the the and the culture and the religion of the communities they're trying to overrun. And they're doing that through importing immigrants who don't share those same values. So let's get to the actual assassination itself. Mike, how did you feel? What were your feelings when you, when you read about it, you know, this time when you were, you you would read about this family, you'd kind of got to know them in a, in a big way. And then you read about how they were murdered. What, what were your feelings? Um, very, very mixed. Um, a lot of sadness. Um, <laughs> happy to say that I, I, I cried <laughs> quite a bit. Um, the the way that they were killed, and also what happened to them after, was just horrendous. And it, it it's gut wrenching. It's it really is. It's uh it's not a pleasant read it's not for the faint hearted that's for sure it's not definitely and so that that's a good um segue in to say that typically this is a very family friendly show but i we are going to go over a bit the execution right now so if you do have children or you're watching this on recording with children in the room um particularly little ones you probably want to either pause it here and watch it another time or get them doing a different activity in a different room. Um, I think that it's, it is, it is gruesome to talk about the way they were, they were executed, but I think that it's really important that we understand both physically, literally, as well as metaphorically what this Bolshevik communist socialist ideology ends in. Um, You know, we, we can see it in China. We can see it in South America people starving on the streets, a lot of corruption. But the story of the murder and the the brutal execution of this beautiful Christian family is really an apt um, micro example of what this ideology does in the macro, what its end goal is, which is to destroy the family, um, both physically and metaphorically. Um, so I'm just going to read a little bit from the, just from the Wikipedia page on this. Um, and this is the execution of the Romana family is something that we've kind of, as the years have gone on, um, through forensic analysis and things like this, we've gleaned additional information. So this is a kind of an, almost an ever evolving story. There's new details. When we were looking into it for this campaign, I was actually really shocked at how much more detail was out um, now than it was the last time I had gone through the story. So um, the uh, the Russian Imperial Romanov family, which included the five children, Olga, Tatiana, Maria, Anastasia, and Alexei, um, were um, imprisoned along with um, some servants. Uh, you And I might slaughter these names, so um, Lord forgive me, but Eugene Botkin, Anna, Dimadova, Alexei Trump, Ivan Karatonov. Um, they were shot, bayoneted, and clubbed to death. Um, the night of the 16th through the 17th of July, 1918. The Tsar and his family were killed by several Bolshevik troops um, who were led by a guy named Yakov Yurovsky under the orders of the Ural Regions, Regional Soviet um and who was operating under instructions from Lenin who was the guy in charge of the whole uh shebang um 
so following the February revolution, the Romanov family and their loyal servants were imprisoned in Alexandra Palace. And then they were moved to Tobla. To, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right. Toblos, Toblosk, um, where they were killed. Um, let's see. I don't need to read every single bit about it, but let's, I mean, I just kind of want to jump through this a little bit. So Mike, tell us, have you read um, about what was their imprisonment like for that, those, those several months before their, their death? And what was the family's, what were their spirits like? What, how, how did they deal with this difficult situation? Um, their conditions in the, in the house were, um, were not good. Uh, the house was completely boarded up, basically. Um, there was a wooden fence, picketed fence, whatever you might want to call it, around the perimeter of the house. Um, the windows were all painted white so that no natural light could be let in. Um, and no air was, fresh air from outside was let in. They were allowed a small amount of time to exercise in a small garden every day, but that was pretty much all the outside um, time that they got. They had no correspondence whatsoever with the outside world. Um, when they were imprisoned in the Alexander Palace, for example, they were still allowed some freedoms to send letters to friends and receive them. Uh, but here for the 78 days, I think it was, that they were at this place, they were not... Um, not any correspondence with the outside world. But having said that, though, as we've alluded to earlier, they were a very close family, a very close-knit family. And they pulled together and relied on each other for strength and support and their faith to, um, to, to hold themselves together in the, in the face of what seemed like insurmountable odds. Yes, definitely. And I think that that's so inspiring because we often think of royalty as being spoiled and posh and princesses as being very bratty and these sorts of stereotypes that go along with, with royalty. And while that may be the ca case for some, it definitely was not the case for this family. And I think that it speaks volumes to the way that they dealt with their um, really bad lot that they had in life prior to their execution. And of course, you know, there's also the not knowing what's going to happen. You know, of course, it was in the back of their minds. I'm sure that they could be executed. Um, and so that just kind of this waiting game, would someone come rescue them? Would the revolution peter out? Would another group take control and then come get them? All of this, this guessing game while, while living in these conditions and Alexei is very ill and they don't have you know, access to their regular um, doctors and physicians and nurses and, and, and spiritual um, places and churches and things like this. Um, and, it, it really speaks volumes, I think, to the sincerity of the family and their faith that they dealt with it so well. And now they're really, you know, there isn't any, uh, you know, there are reports from guards and such talking about how bratty or upset or, you know, angry the, the family got or were. Definitely they had hardships, but um, a lot of the guards absolutely adored the family. Uh, in, in fact, some of those, the young men quite fell in love with those girls. Um, they were bo enduring both in, in beauty, outward beauty, as well as inward beauty. And I think that it's always such an amazing testament to the, to the faith of a family when they have all of that opulence, all of that regalness and all of that access to the, the, at the time, the wealthiest, you know, monarch in human history. And yet they, they were so pious in, in their, in their mannerisms. Um, I to break in just really quick and say that Lily Newsom sent us a $5 super chat and she says, I wish I could keep watching. This is great. Um, and, uh, anyways, thank you so much, Lily. I really appreciate that. We always appreciate your support. Um, and if you'd like to know of ways that you can continue to support the ministry, um, in addition to super chats, which we always enjoy, you can go to wifewithapurpose.com forward slash support. Um, so 
I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go back on screen share and um, I'm going to share a clip from the movie of, um, let's see, it, uh, from the Romanoff movie that they did a few years back of the execution. And I'm just going to go ahead and read a little bit about it and we can watch this. And if you haven't seen uh, N Nicholas and Alexandra and um, other movies like that, um, I, I urge you to to check them out. There's been a couple of very well done um, uh, movies on their life. Um, so while the Romanovs were having dinner on the 16th of July, 1918, Yurovsky, who that was the man in charge of um, holding them, entered the sitting room and informed them that the kitchen boy um, was leaving to meet his uncle. Um, who had returned to the city and as, was asking to see him. Ivan had, but that little boy had already been shot and killed. Um, and that's something that they did. Uh, they started kind of killing people off. You see, one of the main things to stress is that this, this murder had to happen in secret because the Russian people, again, loved the royal family. And had they found out that the communists had killed them, they would have revolted. They never would have accepted the commun communist party. Um, the family was upset because they had lost a, a, one of their playmates and Alexandria did not trust the, the uh, tale that they were being told. And one of the last things she wrote in her diary before her death was we shall, well, sh we shall see if we'll ever see that boy again. So she was already suspicious. Um, around midnight on the 17th of July, Yurovsky, um, uh, let's see. Um, asked the, the family physician Botkin to awaken the sleeping family and ask them to put on their clothes under the pretext that the family would be moved to a safe location um, during some impending chaos that was happening. The Romanovs were ordered to sit in a very small room in a basement. Nicholas asked if um, he could bring in some chairs because um, Alexei, obviously, as we said before, could not walk and was ill. Um, let's see. Um, a few minutes later, an execution squad of secret police was brought in and they were given the order to execute them. Um, Nicholas facing his family turned and said, what, what? Yurowski quickly repeated the order and the weapons were raised. The Empress and Grand Duchess Olga, according to a guard's reminiscence, had tried to bless themselves but failed amid the shooting. Yurowski re repeatedly raised his Colt gun to Nicholas's torso and fired. Nicholas was the target of all of the assembled shooters and he quickly fell dead, pierced by many bullets. Um, let's see. Uh, Alexandra was shot in the, the head. Um, the Maria was shot who uh, ran. Uh, he shot at Maria, excuse me, who ran for the double doors, um, hitting her thigh. The remaining executioners shot chaotically all over Um the room, uh, smoke and dust was everywhere. Um, it, nothing could be seen. Um, noise was, the noise was chaotic. Um, some, one of the, the guards ran into the street to check the noise levels and heard that local dogs were barking at the sound of, of all of this. Um, he hurried downstairs and told the men to stop firing and to kill the family and their dogs with the gun butts and bayonets instead within minutes um, they were forced to stop shooting because of the caustic smoke, um, and gunpowder and dust and the plaster, um, from the ceiling, um, uh, caused by the reverberation of bullets and the, de and deafening gunshots. Um, when they stopped, the doors, uh, were then opened and to, to scatter the smoke while they're waiting for the smoke to abate, the killers heard moans and whimpers inside the room. As it was cleared, it became evident that although several of the family's retainers had been killed, all of the imperial children were alive. And furthermore, only furthermore, only Maria had even been injured. The noise of the guns had been heard by the household all around and had awakened many people. They so they went ahead um, and quickly continued the execution um, using the bayonets. Um, let's see here. Um, it proved ineffective um, and meant that the children had to be dis dispatched um, by still more gunshots, this time aimed more precisely at their heads. Um, the Tsarevich, so that's uh, Alexei, the little boy, was the first of the children to be executed. Um, he was uh, shot in the ear. The girls, he, so he had also had, so the girls as well as, as Alexei had had 
jewelry sewn into their undergarments because of course they didn't know where they were going, where they were going to be moved. So a precaution that their mother had taken was to take some of the royal jewels and sew it inside their clothing so that if they ended up, you know, in the middle of the woods or, or trying to escape, they had uh, something there to work with money wise. And so that ended up meaning that the, um, a lot of the bullets were, were just literally ricocheting off of these children. Um, so the last to die were Tatiana, Anastasia, and Maria, who were carrying uh, several pounds each of diamonds sewn into their clothing. Um, however, uh, they were speared with bayonets. Um, Olga sustained a gunshot wound to the head. Maria and Anastasia were said to have crouched up against a wall, covering their heads in terror until they were shot down. Yurovsky himself uh, killed Tatiana and Alexei. Tatiana died from a single bullet through the back of her head, and Alexei received two bullets in the head right behind the ear. I've heard other accounts say that it was actually in his ear. I don't know that it really matters. Um, the maid uh, survived the initial onslaught, was quickly stabbed to death against the back of a wall while trying to defend herself with a small pillow full of precious jewels. I'm going to go ahead and uh, screenshot again um, and just show a picture of the family instead of me reading because I think that would be um, more appropriate. Hold on just one moment. If I can get it to work. Oh, is it not? Is it still screen sharing? No. I'm really bad at this. <laughs> Hold on a second. Okay, no, it's got it, my camera's on. It won't let me screen share now for some reason. That's fine. Funny. Let me try again. Screen share. Yeah, I click it and it does nothing. Okay. Oh, no, there it goes. Okay. It just wasn't wanting to work. Okay. Um, so let's go back. Um, and we'll get a picture of them. Okay. Um, so then the Yurovsky, uh, he started to check the victims for pulses. Um, they went back and forth, uh, amongst flailing bodies with the bayonets. The execution lasted a total of 20 minutes. Um, so if you can imagine um, how long that is, uh, especially for children. Um, they chalked it up to poor mastery of their weapons and nerves because a lot of these guards also did not want to execute this family. Um, let's see. So... I'll just just stop there um, as far as the reading from the, the Wikipedia to say that um, basically what they ended up doing, they needed to hide the bodies. And these were, I mean, quite a lot of bodies. Obviously, it was a large family, five children, two adults, plus there was the the, the dog, even the family dogs, the um, some of their kind of ladies in waiting, for lack of a better term, and um, the doctor and things like this that they had with them. And so this was quite a lot of bodies to get rid of, and they were in a very small Russian town. And again, burying them in any kind of a grave would have been very quickly found by most people. So one of the things that they had uh, prepped ahead of time was to get vats of acid to throw the bodies into, to um, strip the flesh off and uh, then throw the bones down a very steep well, which is what they ended up doing. However, they botched even this in that they um, did not, they severely underestimated the amount of acid it would take to strip all of these bodies to their bones. And so ended up having to call in still more acid um, and trying to, to get all the flesh off the bones and, and throw them down this well so that hopefully they would never be discovered or at least, you know, not any, any time soon. Um, they ended up breaking the family apart. Different reasons are given for that. Some think it was to, in case the bones were found that it would be not the right number of people um, and it would make it harder to identify them. So one of the daughters, um, Maria, most likely, and Alexei were put in a different grave. And then the rest of the bones were thrown down a well. Um, and they, the Bolsheviks did not admit for years what had happened to the family. They kept it, like I said, very secret because they knew they could not accomplish the revolution if people knew that this very well-beloved monarch um, had perished at the hands of the communists. And so 
it wasn't until um, many years later that they even began to hint that maybe they had gotten rid of the royal family and then later confessed to doing so. And then even still, they would not give the location of the, the bodies and the bones because they didn't want people obviously going and finding them and using them as holy relics. Um, and then in 1979, the well and the um, other grave site were both found. Um, and then in the 90s, when DNA testing uh, became uh, a little bit better, they were able to conclusively prove um, that that this was the, the bodies of the royal family. Now, there is a slight controversy around that as well that I will just touch on briefly and that the uh, Russian church inside of Russia um, which is also closely connected to the Russian government, has not given their definitive answer as to whether or not that the bones, the holy relics of the Romana family are the Romana family. They um, say that they are still waiting on additional testing. And then that is one of the reasons that they are not um, officially saints in the Russian church inside of Russia. There is some um, speculation by many in, in the government of Russia that the man that carried out this execution, um, who was kind of in charge of, of the whole shebang, um, did this execution, this Yurovsky character, did this execution in a very ritualistic manner, that there may have been um, drinking of their blood and eating of some of the pulverized and ashed uh, bones. Um, and now that is speculation, but it is something, it is noteworthy, I think, um, because we have to remember that, that the people that were able to carry this out on a countrywide level and on an individual level, this revolution were not in their right minds. This, this was a very evil, evil task that was done and whether or not they actually ritualistically, um, involved blood and bone in, in some sort of ritual after the deaths, the deaths alone are so horrific, um, as to be, as to be very, um, upsetting. Um, so, um, is there anything that you would like to add Mike about the actual execution and, and how that went down and anything that stands out to you in particular? Um, <clears throat> sorry. Um, it, um, it wasn't well done, um, at all. It was, it was a, a terrible farce for lack of a better word. Mm -hmm. Um, of, of of an event um and just the the absolute um horror of the entire thing i mean you know bearing in mind that at the end of the day the family were seven people plus their retainers as they're generally called um the these were people who uh, and and the czar and his family especially were much beloved by the russian people and what went down was just a horrific um incident and it, it's 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 terrible i mean even by today's standards it's it's i prefer the term murder to be honest it's not an execution yeah because an execution is well thought out well planned well conducted um this was just a um you know that nothing went from the start it was just all over the place they didn't have an a proper way to dispose of them they didn't have the actual murder themselves itself was just um ad hoc basically um mm -hmm. it was it was it was a, a horrific event but I, I i did read one account um i don't know how plausible it is but i thought i might bring it up um that when the order was read to the czar and his family for the um uh, execution. He 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 said what or something like that. But apparently, he allegedly also paraphrased the some of the last words of Christ. You know not what you do. Mm. Um, I, I I don't know if that's accurate, but I think it's worth mentioning because it also does. If 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 it is in some way, um, correct, it 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 again attests to the the piety and the faith of this man that even when literally staring down the barrel of many guns he turned to faith and he he quoted faith and and and, and christianity right up until the very end and of course um the tsarina and olga 
blessing themselves with the the sign of the cross or attempting to. Mm. They 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 were faithful. Their family were faithful to God right up to the the last moment. I, I suppose the one small consolation we could take is the Tsar died instantly. Mm. Um, so I, undoubtedly he knew what was happening to his family, but he didn't at least see it, um, which I think is some, some peace and comfort we could possibly <clears throat> possibly take from this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's a very good point. And then I would also even relate that metaphorically to that as kind of the way that communism, Bolshevism, social, socialism, cultural Marxism, the way that it works is it goes after the dad first. It takes out the dad. Um, and that's kind of what we're seeing on a social level and a society wide level. Um, and it kind of almost ties into our theme from last month of righteous fatherhood, because we have, um, one of the things that the cultural Marxists of our time do is get the dad out of the house. You know, they use welfare, they use feminism, they use all of these tactics, no fault divorce, things like this to remove the father from the family. And so this, it, it, it's amazing to me how, this one incident is such a metaphor for our time and what, what we're going through as a, as, as, um, as a greater people, um, as Christians, as, as Western and Eastern Europeans, um, even in the diaspora of America and Canada and Australia and so forth. Um, and it, I think that that is one of the most important reasons that we talk about this, but I love how you brought up that he paraphrased, um, the words of Christ, um, which is amazing to me because of course, I think that most of us is sitting here thinking if we're staring down the barrel of a gun, our initial reaction just would be like, Bleh! I mean, I, I just would, can just think I would just start freaking out. Um, I don't, I, I know that I'm not solid enough and close enough to my relationship in Christ that that would be the first thing I think of. Quite honestly, I would just have started freaking out at the, at the place I am in my life. So to know that he was that close to, to God, that that was the first thing that comes out of his, or one of the second thing that comes out of his mouth facing this um, just is, is, is overwhelming and, and really again speaks to his character and, and, and how grounded this family was and how pious this family was. And um, for those of the, you that may be familiar with the very, very popular YouTuber, brother Nathaniel, who is a Russian Orthodox priest, uh, uh, I believe he's in the Russian Orthodox outside of Russia. Um, and he did a video uh, about seven years ago on the last Tsar and the execution at, during the, I believe it was the 93rd anniversary or, or so of their death. And he said that this murder of this pious Christian family is the greatest historic Christian tragedy, second only to the death of Christ himself. And so that was what came to my mind when you were saying that Nicholas paraphrased paraphrased uh, uh christ before his before his execution was that it, it, you know it really does seem like god was speaking to us in so many ways you know evil may do its evil but but god is going to use this to his glory and he's going to teach us so much through this and if we're just willing to listen to what this event has to teach us as a people and as a religion and as a culture um, we can prevent this from continuing to happen in our societies, but we have to be willing to look at the, the brutality of this really square in the face and realize that the ideology that pulled that, those triggers, the ideology that pushed those bayonets through the jewels in those girls and to get to their flesh and kill them, the, the ones that desecrated their bodies after their death, that ideology is alive and well. And even though the people, I'm sure people who are socialists in our country or, or even those that claim to be Marxists or communists openly uh, don't all identify with this murder, a lot of them do. And a lot of them have told me even on social media that, you know, Nicholas was a tyrant and it's sad that the children had to die, but they had to die. And we really have to remember that that is how that ideology looks at not only its political opponents, but the, the children of their political opponents, um, that they have to die. 
for this ideology. Um, they, they are so overly righteous, self-righteous in their, um, in their murder, quite frankly. Um, so we are going to go ahead and wrap this up in about five minutes. So if in the chat, if you guys have anything that you would like me to address or a question you'd like to throw our way, please do it real quick. Um, tag myself, uh, in it and we'll try to get to that. Um, and, um, do you have, um, any final thoughts as we begin to, to wrap up, Mike? I, I think it's important, as I said earlier, to remember that while yes, for us sitting here on, you know, for me, the seven, 17th of July of 2018, this event happened a hundred years ago. It is history. It, 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 it is a historical event, but we have to also remember that these were seven very precious, very faith-filled, very devout Christians and people. Mm -hmm. And that's what I've tried to do with the work we've been doing, is n make them more real for people. Make them, you know, tell their personal stories, you know, about, for example, Tatiana knew how to knit at the age of two. She could completely knit at the age of two. I mean, how precious was that? Um, you know, th th these people had real, um, real hopes, real dreams, real ambitions, and real fears, and and um, and th they were they were real people, and that's what I've been trying to get across. That you know, that they were um, real people who um, lived a hundred years plus ago, but they're still just as real as you or I are today. That's an excellent point. And I really love all of the work you've been doing, um, particularly on Twitter, in bringing them to life. Um, it, it's just really been so inspiring to me, um, being able to read those tweets. And um, if anybody wants to read them, the hashtag is um, hashtag remember them 100. It's the hashtag that we've been using all month and will continue to use. So, you know, even though today is the anniversary of the actual of their actual deaths, um, we were going to continue this the rest of the month. If you want to get to know this family better and remember that they like Mike is saying, they are very real people, um, just as precious as our own, our own babies we have in our homes. Um, we got another super chat from ginger baby 1999. And she says, what was the point of killing them to begin with? Why not continue to imprison them? Um, rather than doing what they did. Um, love your videos. Thank you so much for that super chat. I really appreciate that. And yeah, I think, you know, uh, kind of the, the historical narrative that we're given is that, you know, they were killed such that they, they didn't want to leave an heir. They, communism wanted the revolution to be complete and total so that, um, you know, in five years and 10 years, if people were upset with communism, they couldn't come back and and say, well, let's put Alexei on the throne or put Nicholas back on the throne if he was still alive or or put their, you know, even some of their um, distant, more distant relatives um, were, were also killed at various times throughout the revolution. And um, I think the closest living monarch, you know, depends on like how you would calculate that. And there's different ways to calculate it. Um, they do have, you know, people in England or whatever who would be the next, um, would be in line for the throne if they were to resurrect the Romanov um, dynasty again, but they are very far removed and they're, you know, in no way culturally or even ethnically really Russian or um, religiously or anything like that. And so they really wanted to wipe them out entirely. And uh, again, I think that it is a very apt metaphor for what we face as Christians and as Europeans, ethnic Europeans, um, in that these forces do want to wipe us out entirely. That is their end goal. And we need to, to not be timid about making sure that we're talking about some of these forces that have crept into our society and that are, are taking over very real le leadership positions. And we need to be honest about that. Um, and so uh, Alexander Solzhitsyn is a great read. If anybody wants to know, one of the very quick things I will say before we wrap up is that it didn't stop with the Romanovs. As um, many know, Holodomor was a genocide of the Ukrainian Christian peasant population once the Bolshevik communists had taken control. Um, six to 10 million people, depending on which numbers you look at, lost their lives. They, were, they weren't even given the... Um, 
I guess, the benefit of being executed quickly, they starved to death in, in an intentional genocide via starvation. So that it did not end with the Russian family. All of those Christian uh, uh, peoples within, within Russian borders that Nicholas represented um, died also, not all of them, but millions of them following his family's own death. And, and so the march of, of cultural Marxism continues through the West. And so um, read up, know your history, as Mike says so well, remember that these were real people. And if you want to tweet about them or read our tweets, the hashtag is hashtag remember them 100. And you can find that over on Instagram as well. We've done a few posts there. And um, I guess I'll go ahead and wrap up. Um, and just want to thank you all for joining us this evening. I'm sorry, it was a very heavy topic. It's not a lighthearted topic uh, today, but it's just such an important topic. And um, I really, really encourage you to continue researching this on your own. Um, there's lots of videos, lots of books that have been written about the real history about the Bolshevik revolution, the real history of the Tsar and his family and the real history of what happened to the Russian empire following communism. Okay, so thank you so much. And thank you, Mike, for joining me this evening. Thank you, Isla. Thank you for having me on. Alrighty, we're gonna go ahead and wrap up there. Love you guys, take care. We'll talk to you later, bye-bye.